Hello, everyone. This is David Morse, and I've got Randy Jones on the phone with me. Hi, Randy. Hey, David. Um, and we're here to talk to you about vSphere performance, uh, specifically the introduction to vSphere performance. We actually have several labs, and I'll mention um, which ones those are here in a second, but um, we're just kind of covering the, the first lab to introduce you to all things vSphere performance, specifically around 7.0 update two, which is our latest, greatest version. Here's a quick agenda. Um, we're gonna introduce ourselves um, and kind of introduce you to how the lab was constructed. Um, you know, the vCenter, the virtual machines, um, that sort of thing. And then what the lab experience is. Um, and normally we would kind of um, have a have Q and A at the end, but this is a recording, so we're just going to kind of guide you through the first couple of modules of this introductory lab, and um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. This is me. Um, I am a performance engineer with VMware. Um, I've been benchmarking for gosh, a couple decades now. I started at Dell, uh, fresh out of college back in 1999, worked there until 2013, and then jumped here to VMware and have been on the performance team both there and here. I'm interested in everything performance. It's my day job. Um, specifically, I specialize in SQL Server database performance. I also write um, technical white papers about performance. And I'm Randy Jones. I'm one of the cloud platform architects here at VMware. Um, I started back in uh, the early days of 2006. Um, I've been a part of the hands-on lab since probably 2006, 2007. Um, I was part of the original team that developed the online hands-on labs um, back, in, back in the day. And uh, I still do technology for fun. Um, I I do things other than software as well. So I do collect pinball machines and arcade games. Um, and everybody asked me about the picture in my background. That's actually a, um, a building behind my house that that has my myself and my buddies arcades and pinball machines in it. Cool. All right, so here is a very high level overview of how our lab is constructed. Um, it's a basic vSphere environment, which has a vCenter server, which of course manages all the hosts and virtual machines within those hosts. Um, big change from last year, if you've take, taken the lab before, is just upgrading the 7.0 to 7.0 update 2. Um, and we also want to showcase some of the new features specific to update 2 this year. Um, it is impractical to showcase high performance, such as running performance benchmarks in a nested virtualized environment um, where it might be running in one cloud or another cloud. Um, it's, it's just hard to get deterministic performance out of that. So um, plus you may have, you know, just a couple users taking a lab at any given time or hundreds of users taking a lab. So it's, it's almost impossible to get, um, deterministic performance. So rather than saying, run this benchmark and you should get this performance result, um, our goal is instead to teach you um, what tools exist within vSphere to allow you to troubleshoot, you know, CPU performance, memory performance, uh, network storage performance, um, so you can, you know, learn how to use them in your own vSphere environment. So what does the lab look like? Um, this is kind of the primary management environment. Of course, most of you probably have used vSphere before, which is why you're taking this lab and you want to learn more about performance. Um, the vSphere client should be familiar to everyone. Um, this is what it looks like. So when you take the lab, you actually will see this GUI. Um, it's a Chrome web browser, and you can click 
you know, on hosts, virtual machines. Here's an example of what a host will look like in the nested virtual environment, which is why you see VMware virtual platform as the model as opposed to Dell or HPE as the server. Um, this of course is 7.0 update two um, as the hypervisor. And then, you know, the processor type may vary depending upon which cloud environment you're in. But as I mentioned before, we've got a few ESX hosts um, and we have various performance worker virtual machines that are started and stopped depending upon what tasks um, we're asking users to learn about and do in our hands-on labs. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, um, we have several different labs. Um, the introduction to vSphere performance, which is 01, which is what we'll be covering today. Um, 02, which is specifically talking about workloads. Um, and that covers database workloads, application workloads, um, even Kubernetes workloads. Um, and ESXi ho host subsystems. So this tells you how to specifically troubleshoot CPU performance if you're seeing you know, really high spikes in your processor load, um, memory, um, disk, uh, really to kind of figure out, okay, if my vSphere environment is running really, really poorly, um, why is that? So it, it kind of lets you use tools like, uh, I'll just throw out one, ESX top. Um, is a command line tool, but you can also use vSphere performance charts within that vSphere client I mentioned before. Um, so you've either got graphical um, tools or command line tools, kind of choose your, choose whatever's comfortable for you, but there's a variety of tools to allow you to um, figure out how to best optimize performance for your vSphere environments. With that, um, here's kind of a deep dive into the table of contents for this introductory lab. So Randy's gonna kind of take you through the lab overview and the first module. Um, what's new about vSphere performance, specifically about um, 7.0 update to um, platform performance improvements. And then I will, um, time permitting, go through the second module, which is all about right-sizing virtual machines for optimal performance, um, which covers topics like uh, non-uniform memory architecture and virtual non-uniform memory architecture, um, you know, changing the number of virtual CPUs and cores per socket. And we even have a fling, um, which is a freely downloadable tool called uh, virtual Machine Compute Optimizer, or VMCO, which is a PowerShell script that you can download. And it will actually analyze your vSphere environment and give you recommendations to better, better improve performance. It's an automated tool, which is kind of cool. So thank you. And with that, we can kind of jump in to the lab itself. Um, as I mentioned, um, if you search for 2204 in the lab catalog, you will see the three labs that I just mentioned. Um, I am already enrolled in the introduction to vSphere Performance Lab. Again, that's HOL-2204-01. Um, but you can just search all the labs for 2204, and it should be the first one that comes up. So with that, here is the user interface and we're starting at the beginning and Randy is going to drive it from here. Perfect. So thank you, David. Um, and, and module two is gonna go through some, some great things around NUMA, right? So I've been at VMware for uh, many, many years and NUMA seems to, in VNUMA, and should I, should I give this application 
this many CPUs, this much memory, so, or this many uh, cores, how, how's the right balance there? So David's going to go through that, and David's an awesome teacher with that. So, so look forward to module two in the second half of this uh, recording. Um, a couple of quick things that I'll mention in the lab. So as, as you saw here, we've got the, the lab virtual machine. On the right-hand side, we see the, the guided um, the lab guide. Um, what I would say is we're always going to click the bottom um, Chrome, right, to launch. It should always take you to vCenter first, um, but just something to, to look out for. And then also, we'll, as we go through the, the lab, um, I'll point out, um, at least in lab one and, and probably in module two or in, in module one and module two, um, make sure that you're clicking on the correct VM. So we, we pointed out or the correct ESX host. And, and as David mentioned before, um, you know, some of these VMs are on, some of them are off, some of them have scripts in them, some don't. Um, and they're meant to do certain things in the lab to show you um, a, a specific result. So, so always, you know, if you're not getting the result you're looking for, just back up in the manual and, and check to make sure you're in the right host or the right VM. Um, a couple things also I'll mention in the, in the manual. So you can download the manual. Um, you can close this manual, you can download the manual. Um, and any picture in the manual, so we do have a few eye charts in the, in the manual. Um, please feel free to click on that on that picture and it will expand it large. And I'll show that during the, the guided tour of the lab. So, so any lab guidance, right? So in, from a lab guidance perspective, this is kind of how we, we've done hands-on labs for many, many years, right? So this is 2204, as David mentioned, dash 01, which is the introduction to vSphere performance. So we'll give you the lab module list. So in 2204 uh, uh, 01, there's uh, module one, which is vSphere 70 performance, which should take you about, and that's what's new, should take you about 30 minutes if you read through everything um, and get a really good, um, you know, introduction. A module two, if we, if, if you were going through this on your own, um, it should take you probably 30 to 45 minutes to go through it, um, depending on how fast you read. Um, David and I are your, your uh, module leaders today, or your lab captains. Um, this is where you can download any of your, your lab guides. So as an example, if this is something that you want to download and say, hey, I don't remember how they did this. How did they enable VBS? How did they, how did they do something? You can download the, the lab manuals and you can go through it, find the section you want, and you can actually test it in your environment, or you can test it in the hands-on labs, which I believe are open mostly most uh, during the, the entire year. Um, if you need another language, um, you can actually go and set the language. Um, there's other docs for the languages. So there's, there's that. And then there's also a bunch of links that we have in here for tech white papers. Um, these are really useful links, um, you know, things like vSphere ESXi, vCenter Server 7.0 Update 2 Performance Best Practices. Um, some of the white papers are still 6.7, but they still apply, right? So they're very good tech white papers. We thought it was best to leave those in um, because it's a lot of good data, but this kind of gets you in the right section um, you know, VMware.com tech white papers 2021, and then you can go look at the, the, the best practice white papers or any white papers. Um, and of course, we can't help but, but mention our, our uh, sponsor, right? We've been working with the hands-on labs for many years, and Intel has actually been able to, to deliver an awesome lab experience for us, so we want to thank our sponsor for that as well. Um, with that, we're going to go into module one. So well, let's go into the introduction. So the other thing I want to mention about the lab guide is you notice sometimes I can come up here, I can click on the four, I can take myself through things, that's the introduction, and go back. Um, or I can hit the introduction and skip through some of the sections, right? So if you get to a section, you're like, hey, I'm really looking for the platform performance, I can click platform performance and get right there. Um, so I'm going to go back just so I can get back into where we were, lab guidance. And I'll just mention, um, Randy, that that was a great introduction, but table of contents in that upper right hand corner, if ah. you ever get lost, or just want to jump, let's say straight to module two, for example, you could click table of contents, and then all of these are hyperlinks and they expand if you click on them. Um, and yeah, as you can see on the right hand side that takes you straight to module two if you want to. 
Exactly. Um, yeah. Good call out. I totally forgot about the table of contents because I just usually jump through. So yeah, good call. Perfect. So we're going to go into module one. Um, what's new? Let's go into the introduction. Um, every time we do a release for vSphere, you know, there's a lot of performance scalability improvements. As David mentioned, sometimes it's really hard for us to show you the actual performance in these labs because they are virtual, they are nested, and they are running in a cloud, right? So, you know, where, where are they running? You shouldn't care. Um, but each cloud could be different. We might be just, you know, loading up. We may have 100 users. We may have two. So um, just kind of keep that in mind when we're doing this. But, but there's a lot of really powerful tools that we're going to show you. We're going to show you how to enable some certain things, how to change some things, um, all related to performance, right? So the first thing to note, and I'm going to close this back up, is um, always check the lab for the lab status, right? So this lab status should be green down here, and it should say ready. If it's not ready, please wait a few minutes. Um, if it's not ready within about five minutes, um, then, then you know, definitely ask for assistance or, um, you know, end the lab and restart. Um, try to ask for assistance first, but if this is after VMworld timeframe and you're going through this and there's nobody to ask for assistance, end the lab. Um, don't, don't just get out and try to come back in because it'll be the same lab, right? Um, there could be something as, as we're building these these labs up and tearing them down, we're doing quite a few of those in a, any given moment, right? So um, I think um, last year we ran 14,000 labs in like two days, something like that, or maybe the, the numbers were larger. So uh, we run a significant amount of labs in a very short period of time. So sometimes, you know, when they boot up, they don't like, you know, Windows doesn't like stuff. So um, always make sure that that says ready. Yeah, and, and I'll just add on, you know, don't close your web browser. Um, the, the proper procedure, as Randy mentioned, is that end button, which is right there. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and, and also uh, another thing that we didn't mention is that you do get a certain period of time. And so I think the, the time limit is two hours that, that you get for each lab. Um, if you're running out of time, you can extend the time. Um, you don't want to sit there and just extend, extend, extend. I think there's a limit of how many times you can extend the lab. But if you hit extend lab one time, you should be able to finish the entire lab, right? There's no, and, and that's if you stop, right? So first we're gonna open up Google Chrome. So we're gonna open up the Google Chrome at the bottom of the screen. And then you're gonna just sit here and click through this, right? So it's gonna tell you exactly where to click and what you're trying to do. So you wanna, you notice that it says administrator of vSphere local, but it's not like letting you select login because it wants to make sure you've got the same credentials correct. So we're going to click on the administrator. We're going to click there, and all of a sudden, login appears. Right? Do not use Windows session authentication. Always use, you know, in this case, use administrator of vSphere.local. So we're going to log into vSphere. And again, if you get lost, we tell you click on administrator of vSphere.local, click on it for the save credentials, and then hit login. Okay. Um, always, it should come up with hosting clusters. We, we point it out in the lab because sometimes it doesn't, right? So sometimes it'll, it'll go default to wherever. Um, so we, we put that in there just because, but most of the time, this thing is gonna, gonna just select hosting clusters right there and bring up this view for you. So that's why we call it out. So we're gonna talk about some platform performance improvements. So. Um, we're going to look at a variety of improvements, such as uh, single VM EVC. Um, we're going to talk about large uh, memory pages. We're going to talk a little bit about PMEM. We're going to talk about some GPU enhancements. We're going to talk about virtual-based security, how to enable that in the environment um, in this module. So let's kind of go through here. So what's some of the things that we did? We did some improved DRS in vSphere 7, right? So now um, you know, using work, workload centric approach to DRS, right? So um, now it's not necessarily looking at the host, it's looking more at the VM to make the VM happy. Is that, that's correct, David, right? Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, large application vMotion. So now we have the ability to, to kind of not, not take so long to do those, those large application vMotions. Um, you know, they've always been uh, a challenge. Now, now that we're supporting SAP HANA, Oracle backends, um, we're just making more and more and more improvements upon uh, vMotion, especially at the large application layer. I think we do a fairly good job at, at the, the standard layer, but at, at the large application layer, we've made some significant enhancements. 
And I can't scroll down, David, for some reason. Oh, let me see if I can. There we go. Maybe I, I don't know if I did or you did. No, I did. <laughs> okay, perfect. I don't know why I couldn't scroll. So uh, assignable hardware. So now being able to assign uh, the specific GPUs um, and having HA be able to support um, the, those GPUs, right? So being able to, to disconnect and put the VM where it actually can connect back to a specific GPU. Um, and then precision time protocol, right? That's another another key piece where, you know, in vSphere 7, we deliver, you know, more of a software timestamp based on PTP support, uh, giving you like, you know, for those applications that really require like the millisecond level time accuracy, um, that's going to be in here as well. I think I lost remote control access, David. Oh. I don't think I, maybe I'm not. Let's see. Yeah, I can't click on anything here. Okay, let me stop it and restart it. Can you stop the recording for a second? I don't think so, um, but I did give oh. remote control back to you. Can you okay. um, try so to reclaim it? I'm trying to reclaim it. I can't even click on my VM option or my view options anymore. Okay. Um, it says it's waiting for you to control screen. Yeah, I can't. I, I, uh, you can. It says you can control Dave Morris's screen, um, but I cannot control your screen. Okay. Um, weird. Okay. Let me. Uh, I'll, let me um, I'll just. I'll, oh, there you go. There we go. I don't know what happened, but I can do it now. Okay. Cool. Sorry about that, folks. So, uh, as always, everything. Every, something always changes stuff. So, okay, so um, enhance, did you go through? Let's see, let me go uh, back to us. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we talked about this. Yep. Um, you know, here's the vSphere update two enhanced GPU support. So being able to support uh, the A100 GPU, um, being able to support multi instances of that, um, up to 20 times better performance um, in update two. Um, Let's see here. Is there a specific thing? Bitfusion 3.0 we're supporting now. Uh, spatial partitioning uh, based on the NVIDIA multi-instance uh, GPU or the MIGs, um, as they're referred to. Um, anything specific else I need to add there on the GPUs, David? Um, that live migration callout in that in that vSphere is the only virtualization platform. Um, it's it's pretty cool that you're able to live migrate. Um, virtual machines that are powered by virtual GPUs. Um, so that is kind of a VMware specific um, feature. Yep, so. good call out. Sorry about that. Yep, great call out. I always look at that as we've always been able to do uh, vMotion. So I, I always skip that part, but yeah, that's a great call out. Okay, so simplified operations. So introducing the ESX suspend to memory. Um, so enable enabling faster host upgrades, right? So being able to suspend that um, in order to do that, and we'll kind of go through this, you have to have ESXi quick boot on, um, but instead of moving the VMs around, we can save them in, in, uh, in uh, host memory um, or suspend them in host memory and then bring them back up while the hypervisor kernel restarts, right? So it's pretty cool. Um, we've done some AMD Epic CPU optimizations to make AMD a little bit better as well. Um, and HA support uh, for uh, PMEM or persistent memory. Um, let's see here, it's really weird. My mouse is not really working real well. There we go. Um, just on my laptop, not the other one. Hmm. Uh, VMotion auto scaling, um, being able to automatically tune VMotion, right? For best performance on the modern, you know, on the, on the more 25, 40 and 100 gig ethernet networks. Um, drastically reducing IO latency and jitter on the pass-through network, which is pretty key. Um, virtual trusted platform uh, for Microsoft Windows guests. Um, we'll we'll kind of talk through that. Um, VMware tool enhancements, including the guest store, um, the precision clock, um, drivers for Windows, and the vCenter REST APIs, which I don't think we go through on this module, but that's just another enhancement that we've made in 7.0 update two. Um, suspend to memory makes upgrades faster. So I kind of talked about that a little bit, but basically 
being able to suspend the, the VM in, uh, in the host memory while the host kernel actually reboots. Um, that's pretty key. So we all know that, that, that doing upgrades sometimes will take a long time because we're trying to be motion all those live off of, of the host. So being able to suspend those sometimes um, if it's available and reboot the kernel and then have it persist where, where it left off is pretty key, right? Um, and it's all about reducing the host upgrade time, right? So um, let's see here, quick boot must be enabled, which I mentioned before. Um, there is a KB article here. We've put a link in the, uh, in the lab guide so you can get to that with host uh, compatibility. Um, and with each patch release, of course, the VSX quick boot is uh, support is expanded. So you'll see more and more of that as we, uh, we do more updates. Um, okay, so now we're going to go to the home screen. Um, now, sometimes it's a little bit redundant, so I know that. So we're going to go to home screen, but we're going to hit menu and we're going to hit home. Maybe. That's weird. All right, so we're going to click menu and we're going to go home and we're coming there okay sorry i'm using my laptop for this instead of my mouse okay so we're going to select lifecycle manager so we're going to scroll down sorry where am i at here scroll oh this left again. hand yep. yeah sorry no it's my mouse it's not it's not where i'm at i'm just i'm trying to figure out where my mouse is and trying to figure out how to scroll it so we're going to go to Lifecycle Manager, um, and let's see, let's go down here, Lifecycle, click Next. Um, and as you notice, I'm going through and I'm looking at these. Now, I mentioned that you can look at these screens. Sometimes these are eye charts, right? Like, what is here? And it's kind of hard to see, but if you click on this, you can actually go to this screen. It will pop it up. It'll actually show you, like, okay, first thing we're going to do is hit Settings. We're going to go to Images, and then we're going to hit Edit, right? So. Don't always go by the screenshots. Not all, all the lab screenshots are exactly perfect. We'd like them to be, um, but always try to go through the lab manual settings here. But the screenshot is there to give you some idea of what you're supposed to be doing, right? So we're gonna go to settings, we're gonna go to images, and we're gonna go to edit. We're gonna edit that image. Now we're gonna go enable quick boot. So let's go enable quick boot so we can do this. We're going to go suspend to memory. And we're going to hit save. Let's see here. Yep. Um, following along here just to make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself with the screenshot. Oh, sorry. Congratulations. You can now upgrade your ESXi host with much less downtime. So being able to, to change the ESXi to quick boot. And also you have to go into the VM power state, like what to do with the power state and you say suspend to memory. So those two things are very key to being able to do the quick boot and being able to, to reserve those in the, uh, the host memory. So we're gonna return to the host and cluster view. Now this is one of those things where I said, hey, it kind of tells you to go to menu. If you can follow along with this, because you, know, you might've clicked on something else and can't get to, um, the host and cluster view, like I know I can scroll up here right now and I can go to hosts and clusters directly. Um, but, but just in case you're not in the exact spot, if you just follow along and go to menu and go to host and clusters, you'll get to the right spot in the lab manual. Um, if you get lost, we, you know, you can just kind of step back and see it, but just as an FYI. Okay, so update one and above unprecedented scalability. So as you see, we've got a little bit of an eye chart. So we're going to open that up. So vCPUs per VM, 256 in vSphere 7. In update one of vSphere 7, we can do 768 virtual CPUs. Uh, memory, we went from six terabytes to 24 terabytes. Uh, CPUs per host, we still at 768, right? Um, memory per host, we, got, we can now go from 16 to 24 terabytes. Host per clusters, we did raise that to 96 from 64, um, with the exception of a vSAN cluster. So just as an FYI, vSAN clusters are still at 64. Um, and VMs per cluster went to 10,000 from 6,400. So you can see some pretty, just from vSphere 7 to the update one, which is typically not a major release for us, um, we made some significant enhancements um, to the scalability of, of 
vSphere. Anything specific I should mention? I, I, I'm kind of talking through this, but that's basically what this is uh, um, talking about. Um, yeah. There is a, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, you're, you're exactly right, Randy. We're, we're constantly, even in minor kind of update releases, looking to improve the core platform and improve, you know, even if it is kind of, you know, we, we don't typically expect most customers to be, you know, creating virtual machines that have 768 virtual CPUs, but there, there are customers that, that need to create very large VMs for SAP HANA or, um, you know, Oracle databases, what have you, that really do need that level of scalability, which is why we're constantly pushing the edge and making sure that we're kind of leadership in terms of um, the best hypervisor on the market. Yep. And there's some new monitoring tools too in the Intel Optane uh, under the persistent memory, right? To be able to find like rogue or noisy neighbors. So, um, so if you're if you're looking at Optane persistent memory, um, definitely talk to your VMware rep or your Intel rep, and we can get you some more data on that as well. Um, increased cluster scale. So again, we went from from 96 hosts uh, from 64. Uh, but again, the 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 caveat there is if you're doing a vSAN cluster. Um, you know, the, the limit is still 64. Plenty of reasons for that. Um, you know, some customers go very large vSAN clusters, but there's lots of reasons why we haven't increased that yet to 96. Uh, Monster VMs, um, we can now support a maximum of 768 vCPUs, 24 terabytes of RAM. I mean, that's a monster. That's like an SAP HANA or like an Epic cache operational database. Um, that's, that's some really large applications, but in order to support those, we have to be able to do that. So um, at VMware, we said, hey, if, if customers wanna do it, we're gonna build to it, right? So that's what we've done here. So 768 vCPUs, 24 terabytes of VRAM. Um, and, and again, you have to have the right hardware to support that much memory and, and vCPUs. So again, if you're gonna do that, definitely check with your VM wrap um, and, and we can make sure that it's sized appropriately. Uh, one gig large memory pages. Again, this is kind of important when you're talking about SAP HANA. Um, we can go to the chart, right? You can see some of these things here on the on the memory pages. Host one gigabyte, host two megabyte, host four kilobyte, right? So you can kind of see, um, you know, the better is is going up the scale here on the uh, I don't know, the x axis. Um, so so getting up to three, you know, at 128, we were only here. So we've been just getting better and better with the large application uh, memory, or I'm sorry, the large memory pages. Um, let's see. I think there's something here. And uh, yeah, oh, yeah, just, yeah, you, you were probably gonna get to this, but yeah, this, the links right here basically call out um, those one gigabyte pages that are mentioned in that chart. Um, that's not the default, right? So by by default, most applications use the the smaller four kilobyte pages. So if you have an application that you know can benefit from one gigabyte large pages, um, we do have document or yeah, we have documentation and links here that will take you straight to um, how you enable that advanced setting um, to to get that increase, but Again, you like you said, like Randy said, um, you want to talk to your VMware rep and make sure that the application um, really would benefit. Um, and obviously, you would want to test that in your lab environment before uh, deploying to production to make sure that indeed um, your workload does benefit from the larger pages because not all do. Right. And, and, you know, our documentation is, is really good, I think, right? In my opinion, our documentation is great. And you can read the documentation and you can deploy this. But if you're going to, if you're going to make a significant change in your environment like that, it's always best to ask the question, right? I, you know, never be afraid to ask the question. That's what we're here for. So please ask, we'll be more than happy to go through it with you. Or, um, you know, make sure that we're pointing to the right documentation so you can get the details you're looking for. Um, we definitely don't want you to, to enable something that would that would hurt you instead of help you. So definitely ask. Uh, per VM EVC. So this is one of those things where EVC used to be 
part of um, you know, the cluster. Now we can actually do it at the VM level. So I'm gonna scroll down here and we're gonna go click on the menu, hosts and clusters. So we're already, I'm gonna follow along, even though I'm in hosts and clusters already. Um, I'm gonna go, oops, host and clusters. There we go. And then it's gonna go perf worker 01A. So keep in mind, all these look very similar, right? There's perf worker 01A, 01B, 02A, 03A. Make sure you're on 01A um, and right click that guy. Um, I'm sorry, click on that guy and then go to the configure tab, which is here. Um, and then we're gonna go to VMware EMC, EVC, click on that. And then um, we're gonna go to um, edit this because it's disabled, right? So we're gonna edit um, EVC mode and we're gonna say, enable this for the EVC for Intel host because we're on an Intel box. I'm kind of clicking through this without showing you where it's telling me to do that, but basically, what we're going to do here is we're going to go and click on say okay here's my drop down list of intel platforms right or intel chips let's go to haswell right and you're going to click on haswell and then you're going to read the documentation on cpu mode and what you can actually get um, in in this mode and you'll also see the base article and the knowledge or the, i'm sorry the knowledge base article to to go walk you through any of that um, we're going to hit cancel because this is an example but just keep in mind that you're going to be limited if you hit Haswell to Haswell and anything above that. So it would not be compatible with anything below that, right? So um, we're going to hit cancel here. We don't want to this definitely uh, mess up some other part of the lab and maybe um, in 02 or 03. So we're going to go ahead and cancel that. But that's where you would actually set up individual VM because that was done on perf worker 01A, which is a VM. Um, and now we're enabling EVC per VM level, which is pretty cool. So it's not all or nothing in the cluster. Um, virtual hardware improvements. So again, kind of an R chart, but we can kind of go into it. So, you know, you can see with the different hardware versions, 1918, we're at hardware 19 now. Um, you know, we've made some changes. We haven't done a whole lot since 7.0, right? But from 7.0 to 7.0 update one, um, we made some significant changes. And then in update two, we kind of left a lot of this alone, but the hardware version is still the same. Other things are changed in the hardware version, but everything's pretty much in this in this um, table, pretty much the same for uh, for update for hardware version 19 and 18, right? Yeah, 18 and 19 are pretty much the same. But um, going back to what you were saying earlier, uh, 7.0 to 7.0 update one or two, um, you can kind of see those first couple of rows there, the maximum memory and the maximum number of logical processors increase pretty dramatically. So in order to create one of those monster VMs that we were talking about earlier, you would need to, um, if, you, if you already have a virtual machine created, you would need to edit that virtual machine and upgrade its hardware compatibility to 18 or version 18 or version 19. Um, and we're going to show you how to do that. Yep. Um, so this basically kind of goes through that. There's the doc that actually talks about the uh, the complete list of everything. Um, so let's go show you how to do this, right? So determine a legacy VM's hardware version. So now we're going to go to perf worker 02A, which is down here, right? And then we're going to go to the summary tab. And then we're going to go look at the hardware versioning or the, the hardware section of this, right? So VMware and, hardware. And I'll just mention here, um, this we did have to update this um, from last year. So the user interface for the vSphere client has changed this year. So um, it's not in the same place it used to be. So if you're familiar with you know, the 7.0 or, or earlier vSphere client, um, you'll you know, you may find this interesting because this is actually how to find it in the latest, greatest vSphere client version. Yes, and if you look at the screenshot, right, it, it'll show you the new spot for it under VMware hardware. And then you do have to scroll, right? So we point that out for you, right? Because it's not just on that main screen anymore. Like right at the, I think it used to be, if I'm not mistaken, it used to be like right yep. here, right? Right up top, yeah. Right so up top. To so. Down. So um, when I first looked at this, I was like, hey, where's the hardware version, right? So right. we had, I think that's why we pointed out the scroll, right? And the scrolling yeah. is very quick um, on my end as a remote control user, but 
Um, as you see, it's under VMware hardware now, and it's under compatibility of ESX 6.0 later, version 11 is what this is on, right? Pretty old, um, yeah. Yeah. And we, so, we did that intentionally, just so we could show you, absolutely. you know, how to upgrade it. Yeah, so we're gonna right click on the O2A, right? Again, make sure you're on O2A. And we're gonna right click it, and we're gonna go down to compatibility. And then we're gonna go down to upgrade VMware compatibility, which is here. We're going to say, all right, so so this is a warning, right? So it says this it changes the compatibility of the virtual machine. So you have to acknowledge that, hey, I'm making a change to this VM, right? So just make sure you read everything when we pop up these warnings, because some of them are very critical. Yeah, the, um, in, we got a question last year when we um, went through this. And I think if you go to the next page, it'll actually yeah. go through that warning. Yeah, yeah, and I actually underlined here in the manual. In a production yeah. environment, you should you should absolutely heed this warning and make a backup copy. It's really just a matter of doing the usual clone process, right? So you were, you would right click and clone and just create a backup copy of your virtual machine because it's in all likelihood not going to muck up your virtual machine, but it <clears throat> it probably is a very quick and painless procedure just to make a backup copy because you just never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime you're making changes like that, you always make a backup, right? I mean, that's the that's the golden rule. Um, we and again, like David said, I like to stress that we don't believe that changing the hardware level will always affect a VM, right? But in right. that one instance where you've got a production environment and and you upgrade it and have a problem, we don't want to be that, right? So we're just giving you a warning, hey, back it up. You know, so that way, if it is a problem, you can actually revert back, right? So yep. most likely it won't be. It's probably a little extra work, but definitely go through the process. So basically, we're going to go to update two, right? And later, we're going to say, okay. And now you'll see that the compatibility now for that VM is now going to be ESX 7.0 update two once it's booted up, right? So we that's how you're going to change it, right? For right now, I don't think this guy is pow it's powered no, off. It's, yeah. So and, and, that's why we were able to make that change. Yep. And if, if we had a more powerful host that was capable of, you know, um, maintaining or, or running a 768 virtual CPU VM, we, we could now with this new hardware version, edit the settings of that um, virtual machine and increase the number of vCPUs um, all the way up to that amount. But of course, we're in a we're in a simulated lab environment, so we can't do that. But the point being, um, this is how you upgrade the virtual machine compatibility to take advantage of the latest, greatest vSphere um, features. Yep. So we're, we're getting shorter on time, but I kind of, there's a couple more things I want to hit on on this module before we get out of here. One, uh, um, one of which is the persistent memory, the PMEM. Um, the PMEM is a non-volatile DRAM, right? So just so you know, it's a it's an Intel PMEM. Um, we also have a virtual PMEM, right? And this kind of goes through what virtual PMEM does. It talks about how running the SQL benchmarks and using SysBench. Um, and what we've seen is we've seen up to 1.8 better throughput and 2.3 better latency over standard SSD technology, right? So there's lots of details here. Um, I don't want to read everything to you, but where we're seeing those is really in, in the areas around app direct mode um, and memory mode, right? So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, I don't want to skip over this, but there's nothing in the lab that actually shows this. So I just kind of want to make sure we get to the, uh, the, the, secure, the security. And there is also a video on the persistent memory and how it works. And, and so you can get to that YouTube video here. It's embedded, or you can just watch it inside the lab manual. Um, the virtual base security, I think that's the last of my piece, then we're going to go into module two. Uh, but basically, you know, with Microsoft having the, uh, the virtual, um, the, the virtualization based security, we're going to show you how to enable that, right? So um, first we're going to create, or I'm sorry, we're going to create a VBS enabled VM. Sorry about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to hosts and clusters view, which you can either go menu and go to host and clusters view. Um, in this case, or you, I'm already in host and clusters view, so we'll just go there. Um, we're going to go to the ESX host, which is 01A, and we're going to select new virtual machine. So I'm going to right-click that guy and say new virtual machine. 
And then this is going to walk us through how to actually build this guy. So we're going to go in and say new virtual machine, choose a new virtual machine, which is what I'm doing, say next. And then I'm going to come in here and I'm going to name this guy VBS, just so we know that I did it. VBS, say next. Um, where do I want to put it? It's going to be at ESX01A. It checks out and it's compatible. So we're going to say next. And I think I'm getting ahead of the book, which I don't like to do. Yep, 01A. We're going to go next. And then we're going to say what default data store. So we're going to put this in 01, right? So if you look at region A01, which both of these are, then it's iSCSI 01, comp 01. So that's the one we're going to put it in. Just we would click on that. Um, and say next. Then we're going to go into the compatibility. So 7.0 update two and later, that's fine. We just want to make sure that that's enabled and hit next. Then we're going to go ensure the windows that it's in 2019 um, 64 bit, which it is in this case, you can see that we're going to enable Windows virtual base security. And that um, is kind of an eye chart there. So clicking oh, that yeah. image, yeah we'll make sure that, hey, the, the big thing you gotta remember here is that checkbox is not checked by default. So um, to enable VBS, you really do need to make sure you check that. Yep, gotta check this box right here. Yep, absolutely. Um, and then we're gonna hit next. And then we're gonna say VM options and we're gonna change this guy. We're already on, oh, I'm sorry, we go here. We change this to 20, right? Because 90 yeah. is too big for this environment. So we're gonna change it to 20. Um, and then we're gonna to go to VM options, right? And then when we go to VM options, which is right here at the top, sorry, I didn't mean to skip through that. Um, we're gonna go down to the boot options. And we'll see boot options, oops. And all we're really showing you here is that when the boot options, when you have VBS enabled, uh, EFI is always there and secure boot is always enabled. There's nothing you can do to change that. So if you choose VBS, those two things will always be set, right? They're, they're hard set. Um, in this case, because it's a lab, we're gonna go ahead and get canceled, but all you would have to do is hit next and go. And basically you're gonna have a VBS enabled Windows box, right? A Windows 19 uh, 64 bit. So we'll hit cancel, but that's all you would need to do to set up BBS. Um, and that's basically the conclusion of module one. Um, at this point, I'm gonna pass it over to David. I've kind of taken up all his time with my, no. my, uh, my, mouse, my mouse issues. Um, and uh, David, take over and uh, we'll go into module two. All right, thanks Randy. Um, so yeah, we finished module one, so just, Oh, quick call out here. We do have an Odyssey lab that you can take afterwards. Um, there's the SKU for 2204-81. That's a game that actually tests your skills. For So for whatever you learn in um, all three labs, 01, 02, and 03, um, remember to take this lab. There's actually um, a challenge with prizes. So um, remember to do that, especially for the VMworld time frame. Here's module two. So um, it contains several things um, and I'm gonna kind of go through some of these quickly. Um, NUMA, VNUMA, UMA, you know, there's a lot of acronyms here that um, honestly, um, I'm not gonna spend too, too much time on because most of this is honestly kind of a history lesson, um, you know, Long time ago, <laughs> before modern day um, servers, everything had one memory controller and all the CPUs and all the memory had to go through one single memory controller. Obviously with uh, modern day hosts, that's very, very inefficient um, and um, very poorly performing. So what we did uh, or what server architects did was figure out that, hey, um, it, it would make much more sense to have non-uniform memory architecture. Um, AMD was actually the first one to bring NUMA to the enterprise landscape. Um, and here's a quick chart of what that looks like. So every processor, whether it has one 
or two, four, even eight physical processors in your host. Um, each one of those CPUs has its own local memory. Um, that way it can make memory accesses much, much faster. So if you have a virtual machine, um, it's going, ESX is automatically going to um, schedule things optimally. So um, if a virtual machine is running, let's say on CPU one, it's going to have its memory also attached to that processor. And if you spin up a second virtual machine, that's probably going to live on CPU two by default and have its memory local to that one. And of course these CPUs will talk to each other whenever need, needed, but um, the, the worst case scenario is where um, a virtual machine is so large that it fills up all the memory on a local node and has to go all the way to um, another CPU's memory. So that's that's kind of a um, suboptimal um, way of doing things. So ESX is very good about local scheduling. So when you create a virtual machine, um, it's gonna optimally be on a CPU with local memory. And here's kind of what things look like without NUMA and with virtual virtual NUMA. So there's there's NUMA and then there's virtual NUMA. But the good news is you don't really have to worry about the um, nitty gritty details. This is all pretty technical for most customers. So if you wanna read more about this, um, there are links in the manual uh, that, that go into great detail about what VNUMA is and how to change those advanced settings. But uh, you probably don't need too too much um, detail on it. So let's take a look at Perf Worker One A. Um, we're going to click Edit Settings. Choose right here. So let's take a look at um, what we could set the number of vCPUs to. So first thing, we're gonna expand CPUs. We're gonna change the virtual CPUs from one, the default, to four. And notice here that it's got some other things selected, right? So by default, there's this field called cores per socket. There's also something called CPU hot plug. Notice that it's checked right now. Um, by default, when you create a virtual machine, this box is not checked, but this is actually instructional where we're showing you that um, while you can add CPUs on the fly, meaning while the virtual machine is powered up, typically there, is that's not a good idea because um, the the NUMA is not ideal. The NUMA virtual NUMA architecture is not ideal. Um, so note, currently um, the course per socket is set to one. So while I've changed the number of CPUs from one to four, that tells it. With, with one core per socket, that means it's got four total virtual sockets. This is actually not a best practice. So this will teach you how to change this to four cores per socket to match the best practices. Pretty easy change actually. So to change it, all we have to do is select this next dropdown. Notice again, four CPUs, but one core per socket. We're going to change this to four cores per socket. So there's only one socket. And when I say socket, um, that's kind of a virtual processor. Um, I know a lot of these terms may be confusing if you don't deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis, but a socket is really just a CPU, a, a physical processor. 
So now it's four, four, and one, which is a best practice. Um, also a best practice um, is, like I said, disabling CPU hot add. So again, this is disabled by default, but it's never, it's always a good idea to kind of make sure when you're looking at your virtual machines to make sure that this is unchecked, unless you really have may not have sized your virtual machines appropriately and, and think that, okay, if I've created a single CPU VM and I think I might need to expand that down the road to two or four CPUs, then it might make sense. But I really encourage you to just size your virtual machines appropriately um, to begin with, or if you can afford the downtime, power it off and then increase the number of CPUs and leave this unchecked. Um, so again, if you click this to enlarge it, um, this is kind of the before state, right? Four, four, and one. All we're doing here is unchecking this box. So it still is four, four, and one. It's just unchecked now. Okay. And that's how we disable CPU hot plug. Um, and again, there's a knowledge base article that talks about the fact that if you enable CPU hot plug, it disables virtual NUMA. And that's, that's going to lower your performance. Um, so that's really the key point that I'm trying to make here is um, by checking this box, you're actually disabling other under the hood functionality that improves performance. So we're gonna cancel this um, since this is just for demonstration purposes, we're just learning how to right size a virtual machine. Um, another reason to change course per socket could be licensing considerations. So um, Microsoft, for example, um, since both Windows Server 2012 and 2016 only support up to 64 sockets, creating a monster Windows virtual machine with more than 64 virtual CPUs um, would require you to increase that cores per socket value. So what I was just showing um, could potentially be advantageous um, again, in a licensing scenario. So that's another reason you might want to um, expand the CPU and then increase this dropdown value. And then we talk about virtual NUMA behavior and how it's changed in recent versions. Um, I'm not gonna go through that here, but um, you know, virtual well, David, NUMA. One, one quick thing on there though. I, I like the last the last comment you put on there. You should still choose the CPU and cores per socket values wisely. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. So the that you know that's that's um, covered here in the next couple of slides. But yeah, yeah. this is this is actually um, a table that one of my coworkers on my team put together. Um, it's actually one of our most popular blog articles. Um, really talks about, okay, if you have a virtual machine that requires N number of CPUs, and you can kind of see this um, chart here, um, what should the virtual machine configuration be? Um, obviously, you've got a number of different cores per socket values to choose from, and some of those are suboptimal. Um, and it has various numbers of virtual NUMA nodes that, could be presented to the virtual machine. So again, really good um, table to kind of go go back. And this is kind of a, just of an example here, but um, the key point here being um, the vCPUs that a virtual machine might require, um, don't just set the virtual machine or don't just set the vCPUs value. Expand that CPU um, dropdown and take a look at that course per socket value and see what the resulting sockets would be. 
Um, because it will affect performance in terms of virtual NUMA nodes. And I know we're right up against time. So there are some tools to look at your virtual CPU and virtual NUMA values. Um, there's a tool for Windows virtual machines called Core Info. Um, for Linux VMs, it's called NUMA CTL. And we go through all the options there and show, you know, what it might look like to run that command and sample output. Um, again, you guys can take this lab and um, go through your, go through it yourself. But um, the last thing I want to cover, since we only have about a minute left, is this virtual machine compute optimizer. Um, and this actually is a power CLI module that you can install in your environment. And again, it will analyze it, an analyze your vSphere environment and provide you recommendations on things that you could do in terms of editing your cores per socket values to improve performance or change your power policy from balanced, which is the default, to high performance, which would also potentially improve your performance. I'll just quickly show you a screenshot of what um, running this PowerShell script will look like. Um, again, if you run through this lab, um, it will prompt you for things like um, where to put the CSV file, um, what your credentials are to connect the, to the vCenter server. Um, and we actually will output a table of your vCenter, your cluster, um, you know, the sockets, uh, and at the very bottom here, it, it, it will likely have details in terms of um, recommendations, right? In terms of for a given virtual machine, you should um, change a value, right? From one core per socket to four cores per socket. Um, like I said here, it's there's a flag called VM optimize, which is gonna be true or false. And it will actually tell you optimal sockets, optimal cores per socket, and whether this is a high priority item for you to change, medium or low, um, and then details on what that best practice might be. So again, apologies, I didn't have time to go through it in this environment, but I highly encourage you to take this lab, go through the virtual machine compute optimizer, and then try it in your own environment. And with that. Um, yeah, yeah one last thing. So the other thing is don't don't miss the other two labs, right? So there's two other yeah, labs, yeah. as we mentioned before. So yeah. there's, uh, there's 02 and 03, 2204-01, 02 and 03, right? So um, we just went through 01 with you. Um, 02 and 03 are available and gets more and more technical. So um, feel free to, to do those labs and learn a bunch. All right. Thanks, Randy. And thanks, David. Thanks Appreciate for your time. It. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.